Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman, and it's my great honor to introduce Sadiqa Johnson tonight. Acclaimed for their explorations of marital fidelity, friendship, and the difficulties of connecting in modern life, Sadiqa Johnson's novels include And Then There Was Me, Second House from the Corner, and Yellow Wife, uh, the, the last of which is the harrowing tale of an enslaved woman forced to barter love and freedom while living in one of the antebellum South's most infamous slave jails. She joined us for that book back in 2021, though due to the pandemic, we were only able to host her in a virtual space, which makes it all the more excellent that uh, we welcome her to this auditorium with you tonight. Uh, a Cambilio Fellow, former board member of the James River Writers, and a tall poppy writer, Sadiqa is the recipient of the National Book Club Award, the Phyllis Wheatley Award, and the USA Best Book Award for Best Fiction, uh, among, her other honor, among other honors. I warned you about yourself, and whoever that was. <laughs> Just, I, this isn't for my health, people. Come on. Okay. Um, all right, it's because I got glasses, I'll find you. All right. Uh, Sadiqa joins us tonight with The House of Eve. In it, she follows two young black women in 1950s era Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia whose lives collide amidst taboo lo love affairs, ambition, and pregnancy. In a positively glowing review, the Washington Post calls it engrossing, emotionally wrenching, and socially astute storytelling. It, it has also been anointed... Uh, as Reese Witherspoon's February 2023 book club pick. Yes. Okay. There. Anointed was the right word then, I think. Um, tonight she'll be joined in conversation with someone referred to by USA Today as one of the biggest names in popular fiction. That person is, of course, uh, Jen Weiner. She is the beloved number one New York Times bestselling author, of more than a dozen novels, including Good in Bed, All Fall Down, Mrs. Everything, and In Her Shoes. She is also the writer of two YA books about a diminutive Bigfoot and an essay collection titled Hungry Heart, which is an intimate and honest meditation on yearning, fulfillment, and her many identities. She is also a Philadelphia treasure and may indeed hold the record for the most appearances on our stage as a writer in her own right. So, Philly, please join me in welcoming Sadiqa Johnson and Jennifer Weiner to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Hi, everyone. So good to see you guys. This is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was telling Sadiqa, I think this is the first in-person author event I've done since the before times. And I'm very, very glad that it's with you. Oh, thank and you. And we have a lot to talk about, but I'm going to start off with a question that I'm sure is on everyone's mind. The Reese story. Yes. Tell us how that all came together and how long you've been keeping this a secret. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I know you could be anywhere on a Thursday night, and so I'm so grateful that you are here with us. Yes, yeah, so The House of Eve was a Reese Witherspoon, or is a Reese Witherspoon pick for February. And I found out in October. So I had to keep the secret for a really long time. I was sworn to secrecy, but my, my editor called me one day and said, hey, can you pop on a Zoom call? And I had on like a ratty t-shirt and my hair was all over my head. I was sitting on my sun porch and she and the Hello Sunshine team were there, and my agent, and they were like, guess what? You are the February pick. And, and, and this is one of the caveats she said. Reese Witherspoon has picked your book, and it was, ordered, it was originally a March pub, and she said, but the only way that we can do it is if you move your book to February. And I thought, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> Absolutely. So... This is your second piece of historical fiction. Where did this story come from? And talk a little bit about um, your personal connection to this story about, about two women's sort of journeys into motherhood and, mm -hmm. and out again in yeah. one case. Well, after I wrote Yellow Wife, I was sort of in this space of what do I do next? I knew that that was the best that I had to offer the world at the time, and I kept thinking to myself, how do you better your best? So I was trying to find a new idea, and so to distract myself, I decided that I was gonna write a YA book. 
and I was going to be sort of like Jason Reynolds. You guys know Jason Reynolds? He's New York Times bestseller. He's written all these wonderful books. And so I thought, that's what I'm going to do next, because it's so much easier to be someone else than to be yourself. <laughs> so I went off, and I started sketching these uh, YA books, and I knew that they took place in a Philadelphia high school, and I had these four teenagers. But the one character that stuck in my head was a girl named Ruby. And what I knew about her was that she was 15. She was uh, smart. She was beautiful. She was shaped like a Coca-Cola bottle. And so when she walked through the streets of North Philadelphia, a grown man catcalled her. And I knew that her mother wished that she had not been born. And I was like, OK, what do I do with that? And then I just started thinking about my own family history. And I remembered that my grandmother had told me that she had been the black sheep of her family. She had gotten pregnant with my mom at 14, and she had her at 15, and she was unmarried, and she did not have a husband in sight. And there was a lot of shame in the early 1950s. You know, that was the ultimate sin. And so she hid the, the birth from everyone. My, including the child. And so my mom tells me that she didn't know my grandmother was her mother until she was in the third grade. At that point, she had lived with her grandmother. And I thought, well, what does that sort of shame and secrecy do to the parent, and what does that do to the child? And all of my books always start sort of what a what if. And so my what if for the House of Eve was, what if my grandmother had other opportunities? How would things have been different? And that took me to my favorite place in the world, where we are right now, which is the library. <laughs> and I started researching. And I came across these maternity homes. And maternity homes were places where girls who were unwed and uh, pregnant would go and they would have their children, and then they would go home like it never happened. What I found through my research was that between 1945 and 1973, 1 1.5 million babies were born in these homes. And these women were forced to give up their children on a lot of uh, situations because this was before IVF. And so if there was a married couple that suffered from infertility and they wanted to have a baby, this was one of the places to get a baby. And I thought, well, could my grandmother have done that? But as I was researching and reading books, I read a book by Ann Fessler called The Girls Who Went Away. And she talked about 100 different women who had this same story. But I couldn't locate a single black woman in the story. And I thought, well, what happened to black women when they had, you know, when they were unmarried and pregnant? Well, what other options did my grandmother have? I couldn't find out. The research pointed me to people, and they basically said that black women went down south. They had their babies, they left them with a family member, and they came back like it never happened. Or you had the baby and you just had to deal with it. But I knew that that wasn't the end of the story. I couldn't sit with the fact that that was it. You know, as black people, as black women, we are three-dimensional. We're not, there's not a single narrative. And so I knew that if I kept digging, I would find another piece to the puzzle. So we talked a little bit about Ruby, who is an amazing character. If you guys have not met her, you are going to love her. Let's talk about Eleanor next. Eleanor is our second protagonist, and she's in a very different place than Ruby is when we meet her. Mm -hmm. So Eleanor, when I was writing, so when I started The House of Eve, I thought it was going to be all of Ruby's story, because I said I was thinking about my family members. But I was sitting in my office one day, and I was looking out the window. I always have to have a window where my desk is. And I was daydreaming, and I could feel this presence come, and it was strong. And she was defiant. She had this rageful energy, and I could just feel that she was desperate. And I could hear her say, I need help. I want a baby. And I was like, OK, I don't know what to do with this. But I do believe that when characters visit you, you better pay attention. Because if you don't, they're going to leave you and find a, a writer who will pay attention. <laughs> so I said, well, let me write down what she's saying. And I did that. And that weekend, I always take the weekends off. And I watched the documentary, The Pieces I Am, by Toni Morrison. 
And if you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. Please take a look at it. Uh, one of the things that Tony said was that she had grown up in Ohio and she didn't know that black people separated themselves by color until she stepped foot on the all black campus of Howard University in Washington, DC. She said black folks in Ohio were too busy getting along with the people they lived in the neighborhood with, with Germans and Italians and Poles. They didn't have time to pit themselves against each other. And so a light bulb went off in my head and I thought, hmm, what if Eleanor was from the Midwest and she stepped foot on Howard University's campus and this is the first time she sort of faced with colorism. What does that look like? And then that takes me back to my idea of these maternity homes and women. And I read a book called Our Kind of People by Lawrence Otis Graham. He talks about the upper echelon black Americans. It starts a little bit after um, Reconstruction and it goes up into the 80s and the 90s. And he goes into every city in America and he talks about you know, what it was like in these families. So I zeroed in on DC and I found doctors and lawyers and judges and business people. And I thought, well, what did this group of black people do when they wanted to find a baby? And that was the light bulb that got Eleanor's character started. I was so fascinated because obviously you can imagine there's a lot of shame around an unwed young woman being sent away to have a baby. I was more surprised though to learn about the shame around adoption. Talk about that a little bit in, in this historical context where yeah. what would you do in the 50s if you desperately, desperately wanted to be a mother and it wasn't happening for you? It was, everything was a secret. I mean, everything that had to do with women and women's rights and what women went through. Um, there was a lot of shame around being, being uh, barren and not being able to have a child. And so everything was really done in secret. And so even now we know, like if you adopt a baby, it's a beautiful thing. But then ev the records were sealed and closed and everything was done in secrecy. It was amazing to me, um, you know, this, this place that Ruby ends up in is, you know, there's, there's horrible segregation, there's horrible discrimination, and also this is, you know, it's, it's almost, there's, there's profit motive there also. I mean, is, is, that what, is that how it really was? Yeah, when I was looking at these homes, they were all over the country, and actually it goes beyond America. This is the thing I love about being a historical fiction writer is that I learned so much. So the book talks about what happened in the United States, but this happened in Canada, it happened in Ireland, and it was all during the same time period. But basically these homes, these women, a lot of times the girls didn't even know why they were there. Sometimes their parents would just drop them off. And when they decided that, you know what, I changed my mind, I wanna keep my baby. They were shamed, they were forced to sign papers, they were told that if they tried to leave with their baby that they would call the police and have them arrested. Um, they often said that they were neurotic and they needed to treat, the, they needed to treat their, their psychiatric brain and this was all because the girls got pregnant out of wedlock. This was the full motivation. And it was also a business, so these homes took these children and turned them over for a profit. So it was, a, it was sort of like a baby-making machine, and a lot of women suffered. The, the records were sealed, and so there's a lot of websites, actually, particularly on Facebook and Facebook groups of, oh, I had a baby at the Florence Crittenden home in D.C. in 1955. It was a girl. I don't know what happened to her. Can you help me? And there's a lot of that that has gone on um, in the last few years. There's a lot of families that have been reunited after this, but it was definitely a period of our history that was pretty dark, particularly for women and, um, and sad. I, and you know, of course, there's the passage where Ruby has realized that she's pregnant. She's, she's living with her aunt because her mother kind of wants nothing to do with her. Her mother's boyfriend is, you know, interested in Ruby in a way that he shouldn't be. So she's discovered that she's pregnant and she's trying like every home remedy that you could think of back then. And it's, it's just, you know, 
to think about how far we've come and how far we haven't come. Um, so I wanted to ask about the men a little bit because there, there are romantic interests in both women's lives. So talk a little bit about you know, who Ruby falls in love with and who Eleanor eventually marries. Hmm. So Ruby lives uh, in North Philadelphia. My, my mother's family is from North Philly and I sort of picked her brain um, I, I love writing, I love writing the truth. Even though it's fiction, I really love telling the truth in my stories. And so I picked her brain and she told me um, about an apartment that she lived in that was on top of a paint store and there was a gas station across the street and the apartment always smelled sort of like furnace because there was a furnace in the middle of the floor and so I was like, oh, that's so good. And she said, yeah, and the owner of the home uh, was Jewish, and so we paid rent to uh, the Jewish man. And I thought, oh, oh, wow, okay, because I was trying to figure out, you know, in my family, my grandfather was very light-skinned, and my mother was brown-skinned, and so with colorism, that was like oil and water, you know, in the 40s and the 50s, that wasn't a mix. And my daughter, actually, my daughter Zora, who was named after Zora Neale Hurston, she said, Mommy, you gotta up the ante. Why don't you make them Italian? And I thought, <laughs> and I thought, well, if I was writing about South Philly, where my dad is from South Philly, and I know that it was like blacks and Italians in South Philly, I'm like, but I don't know about North Philly. So I started researching, and I thought, oh yes, he should be Jewish. And um, he's the cutest thing, and he comes into Ruby's life, and it's an unexpected kindling between two people who should not, on any level, be together. But when I think about love, I always think about uh, Hurricane Katrina. And I remember after Hurricane Katrina, there was, um, when everyone was in the Superdome after, after, you know, as a shelter, there was a photographer who said in the, hor the most horrible conditions, people are in blankets, they barely have any food, you remember the toilets weren't working and everything was just chaotic. But he caught a glimpse of a young girl and a young boy looking at each other. And he took the picture. And he said, even in the most unlikely places and unlikely circumstances, there's always the budding of love. And I never forgot that. And so that's what I was thinking about as I was working with Ruby and Shimmy. And with Eleanor, when she gets to Washington, D.C., she is so clueless about this upper echelon, very fancy black families. She doesn't know anything about this world. And William's family is old money, and they don't just let anyone into their fold. So as these two start to develop a relationship, there is a lot of people who are trying to pull them apart. My stories always have some sort of epic love story at the center, because I love writing about love. I, the scene where Eleanor goes to the Pride family, that is their last name, the Prides, and she's looking around and she's like not seeing other black faces except the servants. And then she finally realizes like these are black people and it just blows her mind because she can't imagine. Um, there are some mothers in this book that are, I guess pragmatic would be the nicest way of describing them. Hard hearted comes to mind. Um, when Ruby and Eleanor each get into their versions of trouble, you know, in Eleanor's case, it's her mother-in-law who's kind of managing the situation. And then Ruby has this aunt who loves her very much and is gay, queer. I want to talk about that too, but her own mother is not helping, supporting, is, is unaware of the situation. So I want to talk about like writing difficult women. Hmm. I always write about difficult mothers. Um, <clears throat> it's what I do. I, 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 could, I could feel it. I can understand it. Um, I have three children of my own. And just motherhood, just the different levels of it. No family looks the same. And oftentimes people love in different ways. And so I really like to explore those different nuances of motherhood. Uh, Aunt Marie is sort of... Ruby's surrogate mother, and as Jen said, she's big boned, she's gun toting, uh, she's a numbers runner, and she's a cross dressing lounge singer. And um, I actually, I love to also base my characters on real life people. So when I was researching, I came across a woman named Gladys Bentley, 
and she's a Philadelphia native. You know, I always got to pay homage to my Philadelphia natives. She was a lounge singer. She was um, raunchy. She was a cross-dresser. She often wore men's tuxedos with a top hat, but then she would wear, like, bright red lipstick. And she flirted with the women in the audience. She sang at uh, the most notorious speakeasies in New-, in New York City. She also performed at the Cotton Club. Langston Hughes loved her and uh, wrote about her often. And I thought, oh, she needs a place in my story. Yeah, I, she's truly unforgettable and a good reminder that, you know, gay and lesbian and other people who were othered have always been part of people's stories. And that's important because I was talking to my friend Robert Jones Jr. He wrote The Prophets, another fantastic book if you have not picked it up. And he said when he was, The Prophets is a book that takes place during slavery. And he said, when I was researching, I was trying to find where gay and lesbian people were in these time periods because they just were not written about. And he said he got a glimpse of it in, um, oh, oh gosh, what is her name? Harriet Jacobs' book. I don't know if anybody's read um, Harriet Jacobs. She was an enslaved woman who had to hide in her grandmother's attic for seven years because she, her master was trying to, to kill her. Um, but he caught a glimpse in that book and he kept looking for it. And so I always want to sort of tell the whole story, the entire story. I don't like to leave anything out. And I think that, you know, we as a, as a people, we have so many different nuances that I like to get in my books. All right, so let's talk about Mrs. Pride mm-hmm. and her relationship with Eleanor, which, you know, I, 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 whenever I'm writing villains, like, I can always start off with, like, this is, this is a terrible, terrible person. But by the end of it, there's some little spark of redemption because I've got to find a way to connect with that person or else they're not going to feel real on the page. So talk about writing Mrs. Mm-hmm. Pride, who eventually lets her guard down for just a minute and but but talk about who she is before we get yes. there so rose pride um and i always use my like names of my family and friends rose was my grandmother's friend and i just it just fit rose pride um so rose pride was is a very um astute light-skinned woman who uh wants to keep her circle very small, and she has ideas of who her son should be with and who he should not be with. And she really will go to any lengths to keep her family and her world the way she wants it. Um, It was, so many of the details were fantastic. You know, the, the, the frocks that the women wore, the shoes they wore, the songs that they danced to. Um, Tell me more specifically, what kind of research did you do? Like, were you reading old issues of like Ebony and Jet to find out sort of like what people were looking like and, and listening to back then? I was actually. I, I love the research process of writing the book because I learned so much. And it started with Yellow Wife, actually. What I did was I found pictures online that sort of mirrored these image, images I had in my head. And I do a picture wall now collage in my, in my office. So when I was writing The House of Eve, I found old pictures of Ebony on Pinterest of women and what they wore. Um, I found pictures of maternity homes. And the house that takes place in the story is actually based on the Florence Crittenden home in Washington, DC. It is now, I think, a, a private school for uh, maybe elementary school kids. But I went and I took pictures. And I sort of could still feel, you know, I'm a feel it, taste it, touch it type of author. So I have to sort of go out into the world. So I needed to touch the building. I needed to walk up the steps. I needed to imagine the girls in the home and what they were going through. So I do all of that sort of visual, smelling, touching uh, part of of the research. Um, There's a few wonderful websites. I think one is called Vintage Dancer that you can pop in 1940s women's shoes 
and the article would come up and it will tell you all the shoes, it'll tell you how much things cost. So it's one of those uh, places that I usually go to help me sort of paint the picture. It's the details that make historical fiction really stand up off the page. And so the clothes and the mannerism and the music. Um, I listen to a lot of Dinah Washington and Billie Holiday and uh, Dizzy Gillespie. There's a scene where um, they talk about uh, rock and roll. Will uh, Wild Bill... Wild Bill, oh, I can't think of his last name, but I think he was like the beginning of rock and roll, and his song was, I Want to Rock and Roll. And so as I was writing that scene and it was playing on the jukebox, I would play it over and over again on YouTube as I was writing so I could actually feel what the characters were feeling as they were going through the story. Was there a favorite character or a favorite moment, a favorite scene when you were writing this book? My favorite character is Ruby, and it's because she came first. Um, and she just, I just could feel her. I could just really, she, this is the first book that I've written one character in first person and one character in third person. And I wrote Ruby in first person because I felt like she was so up close and personal and in my face. And I wanted readers to sort of walk through the story with her as if they were living that moment. And I wrote Eleanor in third person, and, and I, I love Eleanor too. You, you guys will love Eleanor. But it was just there's a little bit of distance between her story and the way it needed to be told and the way Ruby's story needed to be told. So a big question, and then I think we can turn it over to the audience because I'm sure you guys have a lot of things you want to know about. What do you want people thinking about and talking about after they finish this book? I really want you to think about the impossible decisions that women have had to make throughout history. I think this book is timely. I, I don't ever set out to write a timely book. I normally write the story that's on my heart, and then the world sort of fits itself around it. But, you know, there is a our history is really important, and if we don't know where we've come from, we absolutely will not know where we're going. So it's really important to keep these stories alive. Talk to your family, find out your grandmother's history, and really honor it, because our ancestors have been through so much so that we can be here. And it is never lost on me that I stand on the shoulders of very, very strong women. Hi. Um, I my name is Stephanie, and I want to say that um, one of the first things that I did during lockdown was on Zoom was watch you guys when you did the first interview. And this is like the first author thing I've come back for, so thank you so much for doing this. I'm just so happy to be here. Um, what do you like to read? What, what do, you, do you read while you're writing, or do you just kind of hold off until you're done, or do you read historical fiction? That's what I'm I okay. read a little bit of everything. Uh, when I'm working on the novel, I do try and read things that are going to jar my memory or just jar some reaction or feelings out of me. So when I was working on Yellow Wife, I read a lot of novels about slavery. I read a lot of narratives about slavery just so that I could stay in that world. And when I was writing The House of Eve, I, would, I read a little bit of James Baldwin and other writers that wrote in the 40s and the 50s so that I could get the language down and get the feel of that time period. But I am so blessed that now people want me to blurb their books. Go figure. <laughs> so I get a lot of books in advance. So I just finished, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Kathleen Grisham. She wrote The Kitchen House. And she has a new book coming out called Crow Mary. It's coming out in July, and it was absolutely fantastic. Um, I read River Sing Me Home by Eleanor Shearer. That was another book that I got to blurb. And uh, that one just came out on January 31st. I just finished listening to The Violin Conspiracy by Brendan Slocum, which was amazing. I do both. I do audio and I, and I read because... I'm a slower reader. When I was younger, I literally used to go to the library and like get a book for each day of the week, and I could finish it. And now I'm like struggling to, to finish a book. So I have to do both. I have to read and I have to listen. I had a question about the timeline for your process when you're researching. I'm so curious what the duration was for your research process, and were you writing at the same time, or did you do the full research process and then begin writing? I research for a while because I 
I'll have the idea, like I knew about Ruby and I knew some of the things that I wanted to talk about, but it also feels like I start off with all these beautiful Christmas ornaments, but I don't have the tree to put it on. So the research sort of leads me in the direction of what's happening in the story. So I research and I'm outlining and I research and I'm outlining. And then when it gets to the point where I'm like, okay, I sort of know what the beginning, middle and end is. I think I'm ready to go forward. When I start writing the story, because it's historical fiction, there are always going to be moments that I'm like, oh my gosh, how do you dress you know, a woman in a 1800s dress? You know, how do you tie a corset? So I would have to stop and go back and research little things. And, and I sort of like that, because researching sometimes is more fun than writing. And if I feel like, oh, I don't really feel like writing today, it'll keep me occupied and busy. Um, so I do a little bit, I do all the heavy research up front, but I go back and I'm researching constantly as I'm going. Thank you. Hi, K.R. Ray, my son, uh, is writing a book with me, or we've written a book together, and his question was, how long does it take you to write the book from beginning to end? So kind of following on from the research all the way to typing the end, wow. how long does that usually take? Okay, so I'm going to just take it back for a little bit just to let you know. Um, where I am now and where I was when I first started is two different places. So my first novel, I lo Love in a Carry-On Bag, it took me over 10 years to finish that book. And if I hadn't known that when I was starting off, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today. Uh, so it was a good thing I didn't know, but it was your first book is where you're learning how to write. So be patient with yourself. It takes time, it takes drafting. I think that first book was like eight, nine, 10 drafts, something crazy. I probably redid the beginning 50 times. So that first book takes a really, you know, it takes, it takes what it takes. It's like cooking a stew. Sometimes you gotta go back and add a little bit more pepper, a little bit more, you know, soy sauce, whatever. Like it takes what it takes. Uh, the House of Eve probably, was the book that came the quickest out of all five of my novels, which was surprising for me. But I also did something different with this book. I booked places for me to go away to write because I'm really distracted at home by email and telephones and people asking me, mommy, what's for dinner? <laughs> So I would go away once a month for a week or 10 days, and that concentration of being in the story and only thinking about the characters and not having anything to distract me, I think made the story go a little bit faster. I'm so looking forward to reading this book, and I'm loving the way you're describing these characters, and I'm just wondering, do you have actors or actresses in mind as you, when you completed <laughs> Uh, writing the book <laughs> as to who would portray them in movies? Yeah, sometimes I do. Some characters, the, some characters I'll see, like when I was writing Yellow Wife, I kept thinking about Journey Smollett. I just, I love her. I thought she would be a wonderful Phoebe, so I could sort of see her. Um, but for The House of Eve? Oh, I can't, if I, if I thought it, it didn't stay. It didn't stay. So when Hollywood calls, <laughs> I'm going to need you guys to get some actors and actresses together for me. Send me an email, and I will pitch for you, okay? I, I would like to propose Queen Latifah for oh. Aunt Marie. Oh. Don't you think she'd be good? Oh. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, and like it, it, taking it back to set it off, right? Mm, like she can do yes. that. She can do that. All right, Jen. Jen. Jen's on. Jen's on. <laughs> on the case. All right. Do we have more questions? Go ahead, back love. There. Oops. Go ahead, baby. Hi, Auntie D. Hi, sweet pea. <laughs> Are you the person on the cover of the book? Oh, that's a really oh. good question. Thank you for that. <laughs> I am, I am not the person on the cover. And I knew someone was going to think that was me. And actually, for my very first, my first uh, the book opened on, or was published on Tuesday. So I had an event in Richmond, which is where I live. And I tried to find a dress that was similar <laughs> so, that I could, so that I could dress like the cover. But no, it's not me. <laughs> Hi, Sadiqwa. Okay. Good to see you. Same. Um, love all your, all your books. We've read all five of them. Sadiqa was the first. She's actually my god niece, or her father is my uh, god brother. Anyway, she was the first author that we housed at my home in my book club called Literary Generations, and we love her, her stuff. 
Um, one of the things that I like to do when I read is I'll read and I'll imagine these different voices of the, the characters myself because I like to hold on to a book. But because your book came out, it didn't get released till yesterday, I wanted to make sure that I was able to at least read it before, or listen to it before I came here. So I listened to it, but I also have this one so you could sign. <laughs> but and could you talk about the process of um, when, you, when you're selecting or if your publisher selects who's going to read it for Audible? Because mm -hmm. I think even though I like to hold on to books and I love that, my library at home is getting crazy because I have all these books. So sometimes, realistically, you got to listen to them. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a valuable process in that. And I'd love for you to talk about that because the folks that read um, the, um, the House of Eve, they were incredible. I love mm -hmm. their voices. I could feel those characters come to life. And I just want you to talk about the, the process that you, go, that you have to go through for that. Yeah, it's actually fairly quick and simple. And the audio process of the book happens like almost when the book is about to come out. It's not like when I'm working on the novel, I'm working on it two years in advance and then, then 13 months in advance and six months in advance. So we're constantly working. And then, I don't know, would you say like a month or two? Yeah. It's really quick, like a month or two before the book comes out, they'll send you samples and they just tell me to rank them, pick one, two, and three. So I, that's what I did. So it read something else, not my story, but they'll send me a link of them reading another book and then I have to think, does that sound like Ruby? Does that sound like Eleanor? And then I just rank one, two, and three, and then that, that's it. I hope it works out. <laughs> I mean, the good news about publishers are in New York City and there's a lot of Broadway actors and actresses and they can come and like knock something like this out in like two or three afternoons. Mm -hmm. It's easy work for them and they're great at it. And what I've learned, which is interesting, is that there are people who only do audiobooks. They they don't buy physical books, they only do audible, and they are as loyal to narrators as they are to authors. Mm -hmm. They will follow narrators from book to book to book. I did not know that because I'm, I'm not starting to be like like that though. Right? As an audio listener, I'm start, like I love Robin Miles. I love Bonnie Tur Turpin. I think is her name. I will listen to anything that they read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's a whole nother side of the business. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Sadiqa. My name is Pat Black, and um, I have a question about your editing process. And I wondered if you can kind of briefly walk us through how it has changed from your first book to where you are now. For example, in your first book, did you have other readers reading and trying to help you edit, or did you kind of send it out, and then how has it changed through the years? Well, my first novel, um, so I worked in publishing. I was a publicist at Scholastic, and I was a publicist at G.P. Putnam Sun and Riverhead. So I started my first book while I was working in publishing, and I thought, oh, I have connections. It's gonna be one, two, three, easy breezy. I'm going to go and write this book, and then I'm going to be a New York Times bestseller, and all will be well in my universe. Well, my agent took my, well, before I even got the first agent, I was rejected probably about 20 times uh, from agents in the business. I would query, and they would reject me, and I would take the letters, and I would put them up on the wall. I had a, ba I used to live in Hillside, New Jersey, and I had a basement, my office was in the basement. So I would hang the letters up on the wall because even though they were rejections, it would be like one sentence that sort of could motivate me to say, you should keep going. You just, this just is not it, right? So first I got rejected from all of the agents and then I finally got an agent and she took my book to market. I had been working on this novel for so long. I was not married at first, then I got married. I kept writing, then I had a baby, kept writing, had another baby, kept writing. So by the time my book actually was in real editors at publishing houses' hands, I had three children. This is how long it takes. So I have my three kids. My agent calls me on a Friday night and she says, you know, because nine of the 10 editors had already rejected my book. And so we're on the very last one. And she said, Sadiq, well, I think we might have someone for you. She was like, she's going to read it over the weekend. Fingers crossed, I'll call you on Monday. She calls me on Monday. I was rejected again. So I was distraught. I mean, it's, I've been toting this book around for 10 years. Now I got a husband and three kids. Like, what the heck, you know? 
So I remember I was walking through my neighborhood and I went to this little lakey thing by my house and I was sort of like, okay, God, like what is next? Like I'm crying for a vision. Like I have tried everything. I've, I've done it all. Like what is next? And I went out to dinner with my husband and he said, why don't we just get you an editor and we'll just do this thing ourselves. So that was the beginning of me working with an editor. One of the editors that turned me down, I found out that she had left the publishing house and she was starting her own business. And her, her rejection was a writer with promise, but not right for this imprint. So I thought, oh, well, let me just ask her. And so she became my editor. And she and I have been together ever since. She's now my agent. Mm -hmm. Jen, what was it like for you? Um, well, you got rejected from 20 agents. I got rejected from 25. <laughs> and I, it, was, it was the same thing, though. Like, I had been an English major in college. I'd studied writing with all of these fancy people. <clears throat> I'd been a newspaper reporter for 10 years, including at the Philadelphia Inquirer. I'd published short stories places. And I was like, oh, they are going to be lining up to represent me. They're going to be fighting each other for the privilege. Oh, no. Um, you know, not right for this agency, not right for us. We're not doing women's fiction. We're not doing young women's fiction. We're not doing single young women's fiction. Just like bang, 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 bang. So finding the agent was the hard part. Um, I had an easier time finding a publisher. But, you know, when we were getting started, nobody talked about that 10,000 hour rule. But now that I know about it, I can look back at at, you know, the 10 years between graduating from college and publishing my first novel. And I was like, yeah, that's the 10,000 hours right mm -hmm. there. You know, that's just how long it takes. And you get rejected and you revise and revise and revise. And then you find an agent, your agent gives you notes. And then you have an editor at a publishing house and she gives you notes. And it just, you know, it's, it's all people, though, who love words and love storytelling, and everyone just wants to make it as good as it can be. So mm -hmm. at least you're with good people. But yeah, that was, that was my journey. And this is from a number one New York Times bestseller, right? So. <laughs> I mean, and, but I, I also had the bulletin board full of rejections. And I, I remember, like, I had sent a short story to The New Yorker. I don't know what I was thinking. But there was one sentence that said, you know, this is not for us, like, at all, but you're clearly a writer. And I think that sentence kept me going mm -hmm. for, like, the next two or three years. I mean, it's yeah. just, you don't know the impact of something like that on someone. So, uh, you know, yes. For those of us who may be creatives and, and have some semblance of fear, can you talk us through your vulnerability, what that's like, how you psych yourself up, inspire yourselves, affirm yourselves to press send on your books, Ooh. your thoughts, your dreams. I'm just yeah. curious how I, you do you that. You know, that's a really, that's a really good question. Um, I, I, I have to say that there is always been something inside of me that said, it is your birthright to stand in your purpose and I knew that my purpose was to be a creator. I, I wanted to be an actress first, you know, so I went to college as a theater arts major. So I knew that I needed to be a creator. And there's a lot of rejection in being a creative person. Um, but I, I just kept showing up. Like, I mean, I, I can't really explain it. It was just... It doesn't matter how hard it is, just show up a little bit. Like even when my kids were really young and I was a stay-at-home mom with them, I would have like a teenager come over to my house from four to six and that was my writing time and I would just show up. Or when they were just really little, that first nap, that 10 to 11.30 nap, that was my writing time and I would just show up. And I kept thinking, let them tell me no. I'm not gonna tell myself no. And when I was in my 20s, I have to tell this story because my dad's here. But when I was in my 20s, I had it in my mind that I was going to grad school, right? Because I was like, well, writers, that's what you do. You have to get an MFA. And I went to, I, I was living in Edison, New Jersey, and I applied for NYU, and I applied for the new school. And both of them rejected me. Like, they both sent me these lovely no's. Like, no, girl, no. <laughs> And 
I remember like walking from my mailbox and I'm reading the letter and I'm just bawling. I'm crying all over the place and I call my dad and I'm like, dad, they said no. And he's like, so what does that mean? Like, does that mean that you're not a writer? You're gonna let somebody else define who you are? And then he's like, I'm hanging up. I'll call, call me back when you get yourself together. <laughs> And you know, that tough love, because when he hung up, I was like, yeah, Sadiq, we get yourself together. And that night, I sat down and I started the first draft of Love in a Carry-On Bag. So you just gotta keep pushing. How about you, Jen? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd say is I think everyone has imposter syndrome. Everyone feels like a fake and everybody feels like, you know, I don't have the right to be here. What am I thinking? Even trying to get an agent, even trying to get a publisher. but. I believe that the people who end up successful in this industry or any other creative industry are the ones who just do not give up. Like, there are a lot of talented people out there, and I'm sure you've met them at parties too. Oh, you're a writer? I've got a book. I've been thinking about this forever, and if I ever get a free couple of weeks, I'm going to write it. And I'm like, yeah, good luck with that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a lot of people who think that they can be writers. And the ones who get published are the ones who don't give up and keep trying and trying and just taking another swing and another swing and another swing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know, your dad who hung up the phone, like, my mother, when I was writing my first novel, um, I would tell her, I didn't tell a lot of people I was writing a novel because I was a newspaper reporter and I didn't want to be one of those newspaper reporters who it's like 20 years later and people are like, oh, how's that novel, Jen? And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, still working on it. So I told my best friend, Susan, and I told my mom, Fran. And I would go home and, and I would say, you know, I'm, I'm going to Cape Cod for a week. I'm going to work on my novel. And my mother would say, oh yes, the novel. <laughs> I was like, what, what the heck? Like, so, so then, you know, I finally get my agent and then things happen very quickly and I get a publishing deal, I get a two book deal at a Simon & Schuster imprint and I go home and I say, Fran, you know, you know my novel? And she's like, oh yes, the novel. I say, well, Simon & Schuster just bought it at auction and they, got, they gave you a two book contract. And you know, she starts crying and she hugs me and we're having this moment. And then she asks me what the title of the book is and I have to tell her and it was good in bed and that was a whole disaster. Like, <laughs> you know, they always say the happiest day is when you can tell your parents that someone's publishing your book. And mm -hmm. I think that's true for every writer whose book is not called Good in Bed. <laughs> You know, but when we got through it, you know, she's like, is it good and bad? I was like, no, it's not, it's not. But I said, why were you so dismissive? Like, why were you like that? And she said, you know, Jenny, I just didn't want you to get your heart broken because a lot of people think they can be writers. And I was like, Fran, I was an English major in college. I published short stories in Seventeen and Red Book. I've been a newspaper reporter for 10 years. I've done all this writing. Of all the people who think they can be novelists, like maybe I could be one of them? And she said, oh, Jenny, a lot of people think they can be writers. So, I mean, maybe the secret is have a parent who like doesn't believe in you all that much. Like, I don't know. I, I, I try to bring that energy to my kids, too. Right, yeah. It's like, I believe in you, kind of. <laughs> Hi, I wanted to know about the title, The House of Eve. How did you pick the title? Okay, The House of Eve. The house, because of the maternity homes, and one of the characters, is when she thinks about the house, she thinks about Eve, the first woman, Adam and Eve, The House of Eve. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Keep it quick. <laughs> What is the process of getting one of your books in the bookstore at the airport? Oh. I travel a lot, and I'm always, the I first know. thing I always do is go to the store and look for one of your books. So That's my I'm goal, in a to go I know, one day and I'm trying. So I think I looked today, and it wasn't there, but I think it's coming. They did tell me that the House of Eve did get, um, I don't know what it's called, but I, whatever. I should be. I've seen Yellow Wife in a couple of airports, so hopefully you'll see the House of Eve soon. Yep. Sorry. So first, hi. hi I honey. am very privileged to be under her tutelage over at Drexel University. I've had several classes with her, and she is just excellent, an excellent uh, professor. Oh. Um, so my question is, 
how are you, it seems like you're finding your niche in historical fiction, although that's not where you started off. And we know in the industry, it's always like you shouldn't genre switch. What is your truth to that? How are you finding that transition? And is it affecting you um, in any way? And are you falling in love with this? Oh my fiction? gosh, it's affecting me in a really good way. I'm a Reese Witherspoon pick right now. <laughs> Switching genres was probably one of the best things for me. Um, I think when I was writing contemporary fiction, what I lo which I loved, I loved all those books, I loved all those characters, and I think they are amazing books. For whatever reason, when I switched to historical fiction, it opened the market for me, it opened my readership, and it seems like people were sort of waiting for this hole that was missing in historical fiction that I was able to fill. So I think write the story that's on your heart, um, and then just see what happens. When did you come up with writing books? When did I come? That's a really good question. I decided, well, when I was little like you. When I was little like you, I used to go to my grandmother's house, and she had notebooks for me all the time. And I would scribble little stories in my notebook. I would write about my evil sister, who was really mean to me, <laughs> who used to trash my room when she got mad. And that was the beginning. All right, ma'am, absolutely. Okay, um, my question is, how much time do you take between books? Like once you finish one, do you take a break and go to the next one? And what can we look forward to in the future? Very good, Thank that's you. a wonderful way to end it. Um, I don't take breaks, really. Like I had, this is the thing, Jen and I were talking about this backstage, is that you work on your novel and then you turn it in. And when you turn it in, you have a couple of weeks while your editor is, is doing her job. So during those couple of weeks, oftentimes, I'll start fooling around whatever, whatever the next idea is. So I've had those little breaks where I turned it in, and I had a couple of weeks, and I'll just start sort of chasing a new idea down. So what I have coming next is, is uh, really is a small snippet right now. I just have little seeds. But it is going to be another historical. Um, it starts in the 1940s. I think it's going to be told from three different points of view, and that's really all I can tell you. But there is a woman, you know, I always like to talk about real people in my stories, and so there is a woman who I've come across in history that I think has not gotten her just due, and I want to give her her flowers. And so I'm going to weave her into the story. How about you, Jen? Um, I mean, it's, you know, I'm in the process of like, I'm dealing with edits from a book, and then I've started my next one. And it's almost like you're, you're married to somebody, but you're kind of like dating someone else also <laughs> when, you know, so like, I'm, I'm working on a story, I'm finishing a story about a bunch of people on a bike trip, and all of the stuff that happens on the 10 days that they ride their bikes from New York City to Buffalo, New York. Um, and, and what happens after that, I think, is going to be a sister story, two sisters in the, in the music world. Mm. So and we'll Jenna's see. a pianist, too. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yes, I have a recital in a week. I'm, like, practicing so hard for it and just, like, trying to remember, like, okay, even if I'm terrible, like, this is not my day job. I did not quit my day job. So we're going to, you're going gonna to sign some books. I'm going to sign some books, and I just want to say thank you guys so much. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's always lovely to come home, so thank you.